In this video, we will be going over the 2013 AP Biology Free Response Questions number 1 through 4. Question 1, this description is kind of long, so I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to set aside some time to read it. Okay, so that should have been enough time to read the description, and we're going to go on to the questions. Part A is predict the distribution of flies in the chamber after 10 minutes and justify your prediction. So we can't make any statements that we can say are 100% sure about, but we can uh, make some pretty solid predictions uh, just using common sense, essentially. So if we have a cotton ball soaked with glucose and a cotton ball soaked with that's not soaked with anything, then the flies are very likely to go to the glucose-soaked cotton because you know, glucose is an energy source. It's sugar. It's something that they want. And the dry cotton has no advantage whatsoever if they go there. So we're going to predict that more flies are going to gravitate around the glucose-soaked cotton ball. And the reason for this is because glucose is an energy source for the flies. Part B. Propose one specific improvement to each of the following parts of the experimental design and explain how the modification will affect the experiment. So we want to have an experiment where we can conclude that whatever the distribution of the flies is, it was only caused by the presence or absence of glucose and not by other variables. So, so we're going to... So there are two main uh, parts of this experiment, the control itself and uh, checking for other variables and other factors. So to uh, address the issue of the control, we can uh, make sure that environmental factors are constant. So we need to make sure the temperature and lighting and all that is constant during the experiment. And for uh, investigating if uh, the movement of the flies was caused by glucose or some other variable, we can try changing the temperature because uh, if we get the same result with different temperatures, we can be sure that temperature does not affect the movement of the flies, and it was probably the glucose. Same thing uh, with changing the concentration of the glucose. Uh, we can see uh, if flies uh, prefer the cotton ball that has a higher concentration, or if they don't care as long as there is glucose on the cotton ball. Or we can change the duration of the experiment because maybe it just took them time to sense the glucose. Or we can use a cotton ball soaked with water because water is also going to be attracted to the flies so we can see if uh, they're still going to exhibit the same pattern of behavior as we expected. The experiment described above is repeated with ripe bananas at one end and unripe bananas at the other end. Once again, the positions of the flies are observed and recorded every minute for 10 minutes. The positions of the flies after 1 minute and after 10 minutes are shown in the table below. Perform a chi-score test on the data for the 10-minute time point in the banana experiment. Specify the null hypothesis you are testing and enter the values from your calculations in the table below. So the null hypothesis is going to be what we're trying to disprove. So we're going to say that the null hypothesis is the number of flies in all three parts of the chamber are going to be equal. So there's there are 60 flies in total and there's going to be we expect that there are going to be 20 in each chamber, each part of the chamber that is. So here is the table with our data, and remember, we're looking at time 10 minutes, so we're going to completely ignore that one minute row because that's completely useless to us right now. So at after 10 minutes, the end with the right banana had 45 flies, the end with the middle banana had 3 flies, and the end with the unripe banana had 12, and the total is 60. Our expected is 20 in every chamber, and our observed minus expected squared over the expected is going to be 31.25 for the right banana, 14.45 for the middle, and 3.2 for the unripe banana. And the total, if you add these all up, is going to be 48.9. So part D says, explain whether your hypothesis is supported by the chi-score test and justify your explanation. So we're going to start by determining how many degrees of freedom we have. And so because there are three different outcomes, uh, we're going to have two degrees of freedom. And we're going to use the significance level of 0 0.5 and two degrees of freedom. And if you look at our table that's provided in the AP Biology formula sheet, you get a p-value of 5.99. And this is less than the chi-square statistic of 48.9 that we found. And so this means that we can reject the null hypothesis. 
And if you use the significance level of 0 0.1, that's still going to result in rejecting the null hypothesis. So we can uh, say that the null hypothesis, uh, there is sufficient evidence that the null hypothesis is not true. Part E. Briefly propose a model that describes how environmental cues affect the behavior of flies in the choice chamber. So this question is kind of vague, but essentially what's actually asking is what causes the flies to do what they did? So, so the fruit flies, basically they sense the chemical stimulus and they respond to that stimulus by moving toward it and congregating around it. And this is called chemotaxis. Question two, an, absorb an absorption spectrum indicates the relative amount of light absorbed the graphs above represent the absorption spectra of individual pigments isolated from two different organisms. One of the pigments is chlorophyll A, commonly found in green plants. The other pigment, the other pigment is bacterial rhodopsin, commonly found in purple photosynthetic bacteria. The table above shows the approximate ranges of wavelengths of different colors in the visible light spectrum. Part A. Identify the pigment chlorophyll A or bacterial rhodopsin used to generate the absor absorption spectrum in each of the graphs above. Explain and justify your answer. So I have uh, edited these graphs a bit to show what wavelengths produce what colors, just to make things easier. On the actual exam, you can just draw, draw vertical lines and write violet, blue, cyan, or whatever on your paper. So we're going to look at graph one first. So where you see this peak here, that means the observance, the absorbance is really high. And when uh and when this line is like way down low, that means the relatives the relative absorbance is uh really low. So that means all those wavelengths of light are actually being reflected. And so the wavelengths of light that are reflected are the wavelengths that you're gonna see. And the wavelengths that are absorbed are the wavelengths that you are not going to see uh when you look at that color. So looking at graph one, you can see that the highest absorbance absorbance is mainly in orange, yellow, and green. And the lowest seems to be uh, blue, red, and violet. And those are the colors that are reflected. So when you look at this, you're going to mainly see blue, red, and violet. So we can deduce that graph one is violet. It's the purple pigment bacterial rhodopsin. Looking at graph two, we can see that the peaks are in violet and red. So those are the, f the wavelengths of light that we do not see. And it reflects yellow, green, cyan, and blue, which are the wavelengths that we do see. And so graph 2 is most likely the green pigment chlorophyll. In an experiment, identical organisms containing the pigment from graph 2 as the predominant light capturing pigment are separated into three groups. The organisms in each group are illuminated with light from a single wavelength 60, 650 nanometers for the first group, 550 nanometers for the second group, and 430 nanometers for the third group. The three light sources are of equal intensity and all organisms are illuminated for equal lengths of time. Predict the relative rate of photosynthesis in each of the three groups. Justify your predictions. So this arrow on the left is our 430 nanometer group. It has a very high rate of absorbance and so it probably has the highest rate of photosynthesis because uh, light, because there, it's going to be absorbing more light energy and light energy is what drives the process of photosynthesis. And so looking at the 550 nanometer group, this arrow in the middle, it has a very low rate of absorbance, so it has the lowest rate of photosynthesis. And finally, the 650 nanometer group has an intermediate range of absorbance in between that of the R2 group, so it has a rate of photosynthesis in between the R2 groups. Bacterial rhodopsin has been found in aquatic organisms whose ancestors existed before the ancestors of plants evolved in the same environment. Propose a possible evolutionary history of plants that could have resulted in a predominant photosynthetic system that uses only some of the colors of the visible light spectrum. So, like, when, when an organism wants energy, it's not going to take in more energy than it really needs. So, maybe it only needed to absorb certain colors of visible light, and that provide just the right amount of energy the plant needed. And maybe, uh, maybe some plants they were trying to absorb higher, higher frequency waves, but uh, these have more energy and it could be harmful for them. And uh, 
on the same note, uh, if they were trying to absorb light with uh, with low frequencies, then uh, that has less energy and it could not, and the plant might not be getting enough of it. So the organisms that absorb just the right amount of energy are the most successful and this allows natural selection to favor them and pass on their genes and make them uh, the predominant organisms. And another thing is that cyanobacteria were already using uh, photosynthesis before plants arose. So part of the endosymbiotic theory is that chloroplasts in plants may have arisen from a prokaryote that was using chlorophyll to absorb green light. And then these enter the symbiotic relationship with uh, plants. So the plant cells could also carry out photosynthesis. Part 3. Question 3. Fossils of lobe fin fishes, which are ancestors of amphibians, are found in rocks that are at least 380 million years old. Fossils of the oldest amphibian like vertebrate animals with true legs and lungs are found in rocks that are approximately 363 million years old. Three samples of rocks are available that might contain fossils of a, trans a transitional species between lobe finned fishes and amphibians. One rock sample that is 350 million years old, one that is 370 million years old, and one that is 390 million years old. Part A. Select the most appropriate sample of rocks in which to search for a transitional species between lobe finned fishes and amphibians. Justify your selection. So it says that the lobe finned fishes were found in rocks that are at least 380 million years old. And their descendants, the amphibians, are found in rocks that are 363 million years old. So if we want to find a species that has a form in the intermediate between a fish and an amphibian, then we need to look between those two time marks. And that's going to be 370 million years old. It's between 380 and 363. The other two are outside of that range. Part B. Describe two pieces of evidence provided by fossils of a transitional species that would support a hypothesis that amphibians evolved from lobe finned fishes. So we could find a species where the bone structures of the limbs are intermediate between fins and feet, and we can uh, say that this organism is part of, we can say I guess it's like the link between fish and amphibians. Its limbs are like in an are like in the process of evolving from fins into feet that can walk on land. And another thing we can uh, that will be useful is if we find the transitional fossils in the same environment as the fish, lobe fin fish, and the amphibians, we can assume that they likely uh, evolved from each other as they were as they were uh, living in the same environment for millions of years and adapting to the selective pressures in that environment, and this caused them to become uh, land vertebrates that could uh, leave the water and go onto land. Question 4. Matter continuously cycles through an ecosystem. A simplified carbon cycle is depicted below. Part A. Identify the key metabolic process for step 1 and the key metabolic process for step 2 and briefly explain how each process promotes movement of carbon through the cycle. For each process, your explanation should focus on the role of energy in the movement of carbon. So step 1 turns CO2 into organic molecules, and we can say that this is photosynthesis, uh, which uses light energy, and this fixates carbon dioxide with water to synthesize carbon-containing molecules, organic molecules like glucose and amino acids, etc., along with ATP. And the ATP is used to, to carry out a lot of cellular processes. And step two, the reverse, is cellular respiration, which turns organic molecules such as glucose, into ATP by uh, extracting energy from the metabolism of them and ATP then provides energy for cellular processes and in the and in the process of cellular respiration uh, specifically in the Krebs cycle carbon dioxide is also produced as a waste product and also in pyruvate oxidation you're also going to see production of carbon dioxide and this is just and then the carbon is going to cycle back into photosynthesis where the plants are going to turn it into organic molecules like like glucose and the cycle will continue part b identify an organism that carries out both processes well this question is actually very simple because if plants only carry out photosynthesis then they're not going to be able to produce energy when the sun isn't shining when it's nighttime so 
So plants perform cellular respiration throughout the entire day as well as during the night time. And you can write the name of any photosynthetic organism that you want and they're going to take it. They, it doesn't really matter. You can answer with anything. Thank you for watching this video and please subscribe for more AP Biology content.